Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Amy, um, the NC for this section. Please welcome our next speaker, Robert Lee, from Brisbane, Australia. He's a principal solution engineer at um, WP Engine. In his talk, he will give us a quick overview of generative AI and its impact on WordPress. Um, he will also show us how to build our own end-to-end -end model and chat box use our own data. Let's welcome Robert Lee. Thank you for the very nice introduction, Amy. Uh, do you want to give a round of applause to Amy? She's uh, working a thankless job. So, um, hi, my name is uh, Robert. Um, I'm supposed to go to an introduction slide of myself. Right, so we're talking about generative AI today. Um, as Amy said, I am a principal solutions engineer at WP Engine, and I like fried terribles. That's apparently what everyone knows about me now. To begin with, I just want to make some disclaimers. So firstly, I am not an AI researcher. I'm only really interested in the practical application of AI in a WordPress setting. There are, of course, plenty of other ways that artificial intelligence is applied uh, in the real world. Uh, today, we're really only going to be talking about generative AI and large language models. We're going to be going through this like a freight train. So there will be a lot of code that kind of goes over your head. That is OK. If your brain hurts, so does mine. <laughs> There will be, uh, this is designed to be accessible, so there will be a CoLab notebook after this that you guys can take a screenshot of, and you can actually access all the resources yourself, so you can build the same thing that we built here. Last thing, we're going to be relying on open source technologies primarily, um, and I know there are definitely easier ways to do what we're about to do today, um, and uh, we're going to use a little bit of it, but not a whole lot. Um, one prime example would be something like OpenAI. So, to start, I want to begin with a story about how I got introduced to generative AI. It was about mid-2023, I remember. It was around about 2 o'clock in the morning. I work as part of an international team, and of course, being from Australia, uh, no one gives uh, any sort of attention to sort of my schedule. Eh, he knows. Um, <laughs> and so uh, we typically do like team meetings around about like 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning. Uh, because it's 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning, uh, I get special dispensation. No one cares if I'm awake, asleep, paying attention, or drunk. Doesn't matter. Um, so one of these kind of meetings, 2 o'clock in the morning, I was barely awake. I was talking to a colleague of mine, and he'd recently spoken to me about a plugin that he built using generative AI. And I was like, oh, that's really cool. So he showed me how to do it. Um, before I go any further. Who here has heard of something like uh, Copilot? Oh, lots of hands. All right. Who here doesn't use it? Liars. <laughs> <laughs> For those of you who don't know what Copilot is, it's basically a generative AI code assistant. Okay? So you can ask it questions within your IDE and say, hey, build me this snippet of code, or what's wrong with this snippet of code, and it'll give you a response. Um, it also allows you to create code that's kind of functionable, uh, or functional a lot of the time. So what I did was, around about 2 o'clock in the morning, I plugged in some uh, prompts. Uh, it was for a plugin that I've been working on for a couple of years. I'm like, oh, give it a shot. Zipped it all up, chucked it onto my WordPress site. Voila, it worked. And I was like, oh, yes! And then I was like, oh, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> so, agenda today, we're going to start with a brief 30,000-foot snapshot of what generative AI uh, is today. And then we're going to talk about those challenges, because of course it's come out really quickly into public consciousness. We're going to talk about how to use it uh, in an open source sense. Uh, then, once we've kind of figured out how we're going to use it, so we'll go through that whole demo, uh, we're going to talk about protecting your data. Um, and then, lastly, we're going to talk about the future of AI in WordPress, how it might be implemented in WordPress, or what I'm seeing. Um, then we're going to go into some uh, key takeaways, but probably the last section, uh, and I think the most important, is I'm going to leave you guys with a call to action about what WordPress can do for the future of AI. So, let's start. In terms of the current state of AI, uh, I'm sure a lot of you have watched the state of WordPress in the last couple of years. Matt Mullenweg has talked about learning AI deeply, and he said it a couple of times, right? And then, November of 2022, ChatGPT came out. And while AI has been around for a lot longer than ChatGPT, ChatGPT was the first application where it came into the public consciousness. And uh, 
hit, hit the mainstream. Since then, research and practical applications have been developed in this space at a rate that I haven't really seen uh, in uh, any other technical sector. Um, you can see here with this long list of milestones. It's kind of years worth of research and development in the space of like 18 months. In my opinion, generative AI has become the most transformative technology since the invention of the iPhone. It has and it will forever change the way that we consume digital media in the future. But time to get a little bit technical. What is all of this? Okay. So generative AI is built upon what we call large language models, or LLMs. Um, you've probably seen that around, that acronym, or seen I don't know what it's called. In the most simplistic sense, large language models are basically machine learning taken to the nth degree. If you can see here, you have what's called a neural network, and we call it a neural network because it mirrors the structure of the human brain. There is an input layer up the top, okay, and that's where you feed it information. It's a bit like your eyes, your nose, your ears. And then that information is processed within a series of nodes within hidden layers, okay? And that would be the neurons within your brain. Um, that data uh, emulates the human, or that structure emulates the human brain. Uh, and basically, with large language models, vast amounts of data are fed into that. Uh, and uh, basically, the output layer at the bottom. Uh, generates uh, a human uh, readable output. And these are checked for correctness. So, for example, you know, uh, your teacher might ask you, what is 3 plus 3? You say 24, and she says, you're an idiot. And that is a way of correcting uh, that model. And so, over time, um, these models are refined in their predictions. They're going to gain billions of parameters. That's why we see, you know, when they say, hey, Gemini came out, it had like 70 billion parameters or something like that. And the point of having all of these parameters is that there are an innumerable number of patterns that we as humans can't comprehend. And this allows large language models uh, to produce outputs that we would recognize as human-like, because we as humans do the rest by imparting meaning into these outputs. And that's why they appear so magical. So, of course, with all of this development, there have been you know, a lot of challenges, right? So first, these foundational models are so large now that they require a lot of computing horsepower to train. Okay? And that means that only the organizations with the most amount of cash are able to train these foundational models. And so there's a lack of diversity in these models. There's also an emergent licensing agreement um, sort of system that's coming out. And it means that, you know, rightly, you know, these, uh, the media publishers that we train these models on uh, get paid for that work, but it does make it even more expensive to train them. Secondly, just because there is a large amount of data doesn't mean that that data isn't either noisy or false, or in some niche cases, even there is a lack of data. Of course, all of this data is also taken at a point in time, and so much of it is old. And then, therefore, this can create outputs which are false. And we call these hallucinations. And because generative AI doesn't really know anything outside of the universe of what they've been told, these hallucinations can be very convincing. Thirdly, because these models are so large, researchers have difficulty predicting their behavior. And it also means that it's very difficult to model risk. So oftentimes, they won't know how to create safeguards until something has already happened. But lastly, and perhaps one of the most long-reaching effects, is the fact that these large language models can create what I call a creatively reductive environment. And what I mean by that is that these large language models, they allow you to create really high-quality media and content very quickly with very little training. And because this is generated from the input of billions of points of data, it's also very, very difficult to attribute where the influence comes from. And this incentivizes the proliferation of copycat media, including software and code, and disincentivizes original innovation. What this cre can create is an internet that is full of content, uh, but it's always similar and sometimes false. Um, economists have a term whereby a common good has been used to the point where it no longer has any value, and it's called the tragedy of the commons. I like to adopt that term and say this end state would be called the tragedy of the digital commons. And this isn't some far off reality, right? It's already begun. So, for example, right now, New York Times is suing OpenAI for training GPT on copyrighted material. 
And also, stable diffusion and mid-journey, which are large language models that are designed to generate images, is being sued for copying styles of artists. In regards to emergent licensing, for example, uh, Shutterstock, Associated Press, Axel Springer, they've already begun uh, agreeing to or creating agreements with uh, AI companies. It's also happening in the space of journalism. For example, I mean, this is always going to happen. BuzzFeed is now creating its listicles with AI. Uh, Sports Illustrated, uh, that person there, Drew Ortiz, is not a real person. He is Skynet. Um, <laughs> that third one there I find the most problematic, CNET money. Okay? They've started creating financial advice by using AI. In, crea in the creative space, I want to ask a question. Who here thinks the first one was generated with generative AI? Okay. Second one? And the one on the left? Okay. Good job, everyone. You're all correct, right? <laughs> all three of these won competitions in 2023. Okay? So, the cat is already out of the bag. So, what do we do about it, right? Well, we can make this work with open source. So, let's start with what we already have. Firstly, we have a place on the internet called Hugging Face. It's basically the GitHub of large language models. There's about 350,000 models on there already, and these are getting larger and more sophisticated over time. Right? The great thing as well is the king of the hill kind of models, like for example, uh, Mistral, GPT, Cla Claude 3 that was just released, these are actually all built with open source tooling. And so those tools are also available to us if we want to build those models. Uh, secondly, you can take these open source models, oftentimes these large foundational models will cre create kind of generalized outputs that aren't always good for every use case. So if you want to create something that's more specific to your use case, you can take these open source models, you can actually fine tune them or embed data within them to create more, more targeted outputs. And not only that, you control that model and you control your own data. But how do we do this? Okay. Now we're going to get nerdy. So let's start from the beginning. This is easy. Generating code. Okay? You've all heard of Copilot. If you guys don't want to use something that is, say, closed source, that's controlled by you know, a, a company like Microsoft, then you could use some Hugging Face tool. So for example, there is a thing called Hugging Face Chat. Um, it allows you to basically plug any sort of large language model into the back end of it, uh, and then you can start asking questions of it. So really, really easy to get away with doing some inference. So, for example, you can see here I'm asking it to create a plugin that says Hello World, a page that builds a page for that. There are also a lot of out of the box tools that you can use that do a similar thing to Copilot uh, that don't require you to use uh, the same models that they provide. Uh, but I want to give a special shout out to a tool that I use. It's called Cody by Sourcegraph. And the reason why I want to give it a shout out is that, again, it allows you in the back end to plug in open source models uh, to help you with uh, code generation. So for example, it gives you access to things like Mistral as well as Starcoder 1 and 2. Once you've figured out um, that you're going to be, or how you're going to be generating code, uh, you, there's a couple of ways to customize the AI that's going to help you do that. Firstly, on the left, you have fine tuning. And this basically involves taking a foundational model and training it with more data. For example, if you take a model and you want it to behave a little bit more like Christopher Walken, you may ingest a lot of Christopher Walken quotes and tell it to more cowbell, right? Now, what will happen is once you've ingested all of these quotes and you ask it a question, it may give you the mannerisms of Christopher Walken when it responds to you and add a lot of more cowbell to the end of everything, but you won't be able to control the specifics of the output itself. For a more specific output, you'll want to do what's called embedding. And this is the second way that you want to tra or kind of shape the output of your uh, large language model. And the way that that works is you're going to take existing data that you have, we're going to put it in an external database called a vector database. And that way, the large language model can use the context that's provided by the data in that external database to give you a more targeted output. Right? An example might be, if you want to create, say, a financial forecast for your company, right? you might ingest a lot of historical financial data into a vector database and then say, tell me what 2025 is going to look like for me. And it'll spit out something that looks very similar to like what you ingested. In order to do this, we're going to do a bit of a demo today. Like I said, it's going to go like a freight train. So please don't uh, get scared. I, I'm scared enough. Um, 
<laughs> I'm going to start by exporting data from our WordPress site uh, into a CSV file from the MySQL database. We're going to manipulate that data so it can be accepted into a large language model. Then we're going to try fine tune it with a package called AutoTrain, which is created by Hugging Face again. Um, and then we're going to be taking the same data and embedding it into a vector database uh, created by ChromaDB. Then we're going to chain all of that together and put it back on our WordPress site as a chatbot. Okay? To do this, you need some Python. Of course, you need your aforementioned hugging face. Uh, you need some sort of hyperscaler. In my case, I'm using AWS. You can use anything else that you want. To make it a little bit easier, I'm also going to be using an OpenAI endpoint, but there is actually, within the Colab notebook that I'm giving you guys, an open source way to do this as well. Right. So let's start with my website. It's called robs.kitchen. Now, I love baking, but I'm also extremely lazy. So this entire website was built with generative AI. AI. There is a backlog of about 100 recipes in there, all with the images as well. And that's the kind of seed data that I'm going to be using to train my AI. Once I've exported my data, it'll look something like this. You do need to format it in a way where you have input parameters and you have one target output parameter, which you can see in the red where it says text. OK, I'm supposed to use a pointer. So there, text, it's red. Um, now, I'm not going to show you how to kind of export your data. Probably the easiest way to do it is something like phpMyAdmin. If you don't have a lot of data, right, not a lot of posts, things like that, you can use something like Excel to manipulate it. Or if you're you know, fancy, you can use other tools. Um, OK, if you find that the data that you have here isn't sufficient and you want to create sort of a larger data set to train off, then open source directories like, for example, Kaggle are a really good resource uh, to go off. Right. Before we fine tune, you'll need the Hugging Face Write API key. I'm assuming this video works. Awesome, it does. So when you go to Hugging Face, you just need to go into your settings. You see access tokens, and you just need to copy that key. Make sure it is the right key, because if you do the read key, you won't be able to do half of this demo. Today, we're going to be starting with a model called Tiny Llama. It is a foundational model, which is built on the 3 billion parameter Llama model, also Meta's Llama model. Um, and we're going to be using Hugging Faces Auto Train Advanced. Now, keep in mind, when you train off a foundational model, the size of the model dictates how long that training exercise will take. For example, this only has 1.1 billion parameters, right? So it's not very big. But it took me about 20 to 25 minutes to fine tune, OK? So if you think about like a 70 billion parameter model, right? Well, you'll be pretty old by the time it's done. So. All right, <laughs> next thing you need to go through is the Colab notebook. Again, as I mentioned, I'm going to give you guys a link to this afterwards so you can follow along. Um, but we're going to go to a section called Fine Tune Your Foundational LLM. Um, then you'll need to connect to some compute, which I've done here, and you need to upload some data, and we're you need to rename it as train.csv. Then you need to remember to press play on the first cell there, and it'll install all of your dependencies, because of course this is a fresh instance, right? You can see it's doing it there. And then you'll need to make sure you remember to put in a model name to push it to Hugging Face, right? There. It's gone really quick. Basically what'll happen is, once you press play and it starts training here, which is what it's doing, it'll create a model out of the end of that, like a pickle file, and it'll upload it to Hugging Face for you to do later or use later, right? As you can see now, this is hosted on Hugging Face. This is a real model, so you guys can play with it later if you want to have a model to ask it baking recipes, right? Uh, an easy way to deploy it into production workloads is to use something like Hugging Face endpoints, like this one. And this creates an API server which allows you to host that model. It also provides you some examples of how you can run it. Just as you can see here, I've provided some example prompts that you can use. And it'll also allow you to fill out the API key so you can use the code snippets. And there you go. You can ask it some questions. Now, keep in mind, this is a very small model. So when it does respond, the performance isn't that great. It kind of responds like a five-year-old will just say the same thing over and over again. So the larger models will give you better performance. But as I mentioned, fine-tuning only gets you kind of halfway there, right? This is fine for general responses. But if you want more controlled, narrow outputs, you'll need to get into embedding. 
And today, we're going to be, like I say, using Chroma DB. Now, Chroma DB, I like using because it's small, it's very easy to deploy, lightweight, etc. But isn't it particularly powerful? Some other options that you might want to consider are, and these are open source, are Milvis, which is kind of the OG of vector databases, and Weaviate, right? Which is one of the more popular or powerful open source database solutions out there. And the reason why these ones are popular is because they do come with some other features that, you know, obviously when a company controls the whole stack, they can provide you. Also today we're going to be using AWS, and we're going to use AWS to deploy Chroma DB. In the notebook, you're going to find a full JSON template for an AWS cloud formation uh, that is literally a matter of just copying and pasting this whole thing into a JSON file and uploading it to cloud formation to spin up that stack. As you can see in the script here, all it's doing is it's pulling the latest Chroma DB Docker image, and then it's running a script from iGIST that basically allows you to reinitialize it and change the API key if you want to, just you know, in case you've accidentally leaked it to someone. Then once you've copied all of that, into a JSON file, which I'm doing right here. Yep, this was me doing it in the past, and I was really slow. And then you just need to go to CloudFormation, go create stack. You need to upload that file. Now, one thing is that after you've uploaded that file, you need to give it a name. You need to give it a Chroma API token. This is the way that you would securitize um, that, that API or the endpoint to this Chroma DB database, and then you need to make sure that you have at least a T3 small instance or similar to be able to run this. When you stand this up, there are a couple of things I will say. It is a little bit deceptive. When AWS spins this up, it'll say, hey, this stack is finished building, but it actually takes a few minutes to initialize after that because it will pull the Docker image, it'll initialize everything, and then it needs to start up Chroma DB. Um, but once you've done, okay, you just need to make sure, here we go, and create complete. And then we'll just connect to it. One thing, I want to go, uh, one thing I want you guys to make a note of is the IP address, the public IPv4 address, because we will need to use that later. You can see that up the top in the middle up there. And we'll just connect to it. I can skip this bit. That's fine. All right. To test it, we want to go back to the Colab notebook and we want to go to the section called Embed Data for RAG. Make sure you install the Python dependencies again and enter the API keys, right? Again, like I said, I'm going to be using OpenAI here so we can access a couple of easier models to get this going. Um, but we'll want to make sure we also then upload the data into that vector database to make sure that we can make that RAG bot work. This time, we're using the same data when we upload it, OK? But you want to make sure that you typically have the most up-to-date or relevant data. For example, in the future, you might want to, say, put more posts in there, et cetera. All right. There we go. We just need to copy the path, put it into the data file, and then that'll fill that field out for you. And then it's now referencing that data. You also want to make sure, as I say, the Chroma host IP address is the IPv4 public address I was talking about before. Port 8000 is the default, and then you can see that that's the Chroma API token key. Now, Chroma DB handles uh, sort of tables like uh, in, as collections, so you just want to give the collection a name. I'm just going over here. Okay, and then as you'll see, we're just uploading it there. Just need to press play on that. It takes a lot longer than I expected. By the way, I didn't pray to the demo gods today, and that's why they're being unkind to me. I do apologize. <laughs> OK. Now, it does typically take a while for this to upload. What's happening is there is an embedding model in the background that's chunking up all of that data into tokens, and it's uploading it into the vector database, uh, those, those vectors. But as you can see, now that it's done, you see there's a new recipe collection that's come up called Recipes final. Then you want to test that by seeing how many items are in that. So for example, my data set had 66, 61, and you can see that there. And then you also want to set it as a retriever, and then also test that it's working, right? So in this case, I'm asking it a prompt, what cake uses the most eggs? And all it's doing at this point is pulling the most relevant data. It's not creating anything new, right? This is what's called semantic search, OK? And it's pulled back this particular making king, what is it, uh, the, the king Mardi Gras cake, right? 
After we've done all of that, we want to chain this all together with a tool called LangChain that basically allows you to kind of connect all of these disparate pieces that allow generative AI to work. And this is where you can actually implement, or you can connect a foundational or a fine-tuned large language model to the vector database that we've just created, okay? Right, so we get that to work. And then what we can do is we can ask it a question, for example, how much flour would be needed to make 24 cupcakes? Now keep in mind, this question, or sort of 24 cupcakes in general, is not something that was part of the original data set. So this is where we start getting generative. This is creating an output where it tells you a very specific response, right, with the data that's already provided. So you can see here, to make 24 cupcakes, you would need three cups of all-purpose flour. Now, of course, you can't deploy something just from a notebook. So we want to take this code and deploy it as an API server. Recently, uh, Langchain, basically the Microsoft Office of Generative AI Workflows, released a package called LangServe. And this is based off a Python project called FastAPI, and it makes the deployment of embedded large language models as API, API endpoints much easier. Again, you want to fill out the parameters, as you can see there. And you just need to copy all of this code into a main.py Python file in your code editor, which will come up in a sec. So we'll copy that into my VS code. And we'll create a main.py file. OK. By the way, my presentation also has AI running in the background, so I'm just praying with it. Please move along faster. <laughs> it has its own personality. Sometimes it doesn't like me very much, right? <laughs> so what we're doing here, or what it's doing here, is it's creating a Python environment uh, to be able to run uh, this, this Python file. We want to obviously, again, install the dependencies for it. You can see it's up there in the first cell. So you run that within the Python environment. Again, this is a fresh environment, so nothing's on it just yet. And then once you've installed all of those dependencies, and this will take a little while because these are pretty big. OK. Et voila. And then you can invoke the main.py file now. It should have everything it needs to run. Awesome. What you will see is it will come up with a thing called LangServe. There you go. And then that allows you to basically go to a local server and uh, type in your 000 IP address in the port to access it. If you go to the playground URI, which you can see I've done there, you have a ready-made ragbot that you can start using. As you can see, there are a few iterative steps that it's going through to answer this question. It includes getting information from the vector database, uh, and then it responds with some information to create the response to that question, as you can see. Cool. You can also continue to add queries to it as well, and this will add to that context as well. So it'll refer to the previous uh, responses in order to generate the next output. Well, there you go. Awesome. Now, of course, running LangServe locally doesn't serve production purposes. No one's going to like tunnel into your computer and be like, yo, let's use this as an API server. So you want to be able to Dockerize this, and there are some intermediate steps that you need to take to be able to host that image into, say, a cloud, like a container registry, and then, again, deploy it into the cloud. Now, I've actually included all of these steps in the Colab notebook, so you can actually take these steps, and that also takes into account if you're using, say, for example, an M1, 2, or 3 Mac, which has different architecture, it will work with that. Uh, so please check that out in the notebook, and you can get your own sort of API endpoint working. But at the end of this, once you've deployed your API server and connect it back to your WordPress site, you can do what I've done here, which is create a custom block where you can ask it a question. It'll go through the same steps, and it will get you, in this case, a recipe for a chiffon cake. Now, on that same site, like I said, um, that you can ask it. Oh, my time is up, so I'm going to go really quickly now. Um, but you can also see the playground, the Colab notebook, uh, and everything in there as well to get this working. Throughout this whole demo, there have been a lot of technologies that have been connected and together in order to make this work. And so I want to call out a few resources that I used uh, that may help you. For example, the website at Containers on AWS, 
This is actually maintained by the AWS guys themselves, so this gives you a lot of cloud formation templates to get started. The second thing that you might, might want to refer to is the Langchain integrations page. And this has all of the integrations that Langchain puts together and has very robust community-created documentation. If you are trying to create your own RAG chatbot, this is perhaps the first place that I would recommend you start. Okay? Finally, obviously, there's a lot of code and a lot of work that goes into creating something like this. So if you just want to get your hands dirty and just get going right away, something that I can recommend or a couple of plugins that I can recommend, Meow Apps create something called AI Engine, and this allows you to create sort of bulk um, sort of content, allows you to like, uh, gives you a co-pilot to kind of help you create material or, or create posts, things like that. The only thing with this is that it doesn't connect to open source models in the back end. The same can be said for a new plugin that came out called AI Power. It does a very similar thing, slightly more granular control, but again, it doesn't allow you to connect to open source models. This is the slide that you want to take a picture of. Okay? So this here is the QR code to access the website, robs.kitchen. Keep in mind, if you all access it at once, the server will probably go down, so please try again later. The password is fried terribles. The username is WordCamp Asia 2024 Okay. All done. Lots of phones going up. Sweet. Done. <laughs> All right. So once you've created the uh, data, and that's something to predict, um, you can use kind of these methods to be able to stop, say, for example, those large AI companies from scraping your website. Uh, the first one is you can use some tra traffic analysis tool. You probably already use that. Um, and you can use something like Google Analytics to see if anything weird is coming in. Then you want to, for example, disallow directives in robots text. For example, this is the, the file within your file system that tells bots what's to do, what to do. But obviously, bots don't always respect that. And so something you can do that's a little bit more invasive is create IP and user agent uh, dis uh, block lists in your web server. Um, then, if obviously you're a human, you don't know all the bots that exist out there. If you can't, you know, uh, counteract all of them, then you can rely on a bot management service, uh, such as one that's provided by Cloudflare. And the last thing, perhaps the most invasive thing, is using something like captures or JavaScript challenges. One cool thing, though, um, that you can do is when you're protecting your images, you need to do it a little bit differently, but you can use something like Glaze, which is an open source library that's been created by University of Chicago. And the way that it works is that it slightly poisons the images that you have in your website. You don't know, like you can't tell any difference, but if you run training models across them, as you can see, 50, 100, 300 training runs, when you request a dog, you now get a cat. When you request cubism, you get anime, et cetera. All right, last section we're going to go through really quickly. Um, so what will the future of AI bring for WordPress? So in plugins, I see that there's already SEO-conscious material being created by plugins. Uh, secondly, there's going to be AI-generated video coming out very soon, if you guys have been keeping an eye on things. Sora is a big thing right now. Uh, and of course, Stable Diffusion is coming out with their own model very soon as well. Lastly, for content creation, there's going to be AI agents. As Noel, thank you for coming, saw, said in his keynote, these are going to allow people to create content with agents just using directives. You don't need to give it any like, uh, material yourself. It will do the research, editing, publishing for you. For developers, they're not left out either, right? You will soon be able to use vector databases like you use MySQL databases. There are already companies working on technologies to make them compatible, for example, Redis. Right? And what that means is that you can stream usage data from your website into these vector databases to create hyper-personalized, up-to-date, one-to-one user experiences. Secondly, agents are also coming out for developers. In fact, probably even faster. For example, Autogen, GPT Engineer, these are things that people are already using today. And they will allow you to create WordPress sites, including plugins and themes, custom functions, etc., with no code, only directives. For large language models themselves, they're obviously becoming multimodal. Gemini was the first one to come out. Obviously, GPT-5, et cetera, when they're coming out, will do the same thing. And this means that they will, uh, they will be a single model that accepts and outputs responses that will be both visual, audio, and um, video. Um, secondly, these models will start to get more efficient. And they already are. For example, they're starting to use sort of more efficient training mechanisms. So they'll become smaller and more powerful. Not only does that mean that's going to live on your devices, but it also means that because they're more scalable, they will be able to scale much larger and do crazier things with less power. Okay? And lastly, these will all be chained together with tools like Langchain, but in ways that are 
no code or low code. A lot of new tools coming out for that. So some key takeaways that we came away from this presentation. One, we saw the overview of generative AI. Uh, we learned about what an LLM was. Uh, we saw the challenges that that presented, and we also learned how to kind of build that together and create your own end-to-end -end rag chatbot. What you can do today, you can code with an open source generative AI agent. You can fine tune your own model, right? You can embed data, and then you can connect that back to your stack to make it work. And finally, if you don't want to do any of that, you can use a plugin. But there is one more important message that I want to leave with you guys today. This is the call to action. And I think this is about how WordPress can affect the future of AI itself. Now, we know that this is the beginning of the AI journey. Eventually, everything is going to be embedded with AI, from websites, e-commerce stores, CRMs, you name it, your phone, right? But one of the things we found out in this demo is that data is everything, right? And what has some of the most data in the, on the internet? But WordPress, right? WordPress is still over 40% of the web, right? And so I say that WordPress will shape the future of generative AI. And in doing so, I give you guys a challenge. My challenge to you is to tune and embed your own open source large language model to create unique, differentiated digital experiences, right? So that we can all add some color back into the digital commons. As WordPress once democratized website creation, open source lang large language models will democratize code and content creation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Robert. It's a very cool slide. Now we're open for uh, questions and answer Q&A time. I made the timer time. really mad. Thank you. Uh, so thanks, Robert. Very insightful. <laughs> On the um, topic of efficiency of training models, mm. um, you and I, we both obviously just use, uh, when we train models, we retrain the whole model. Yes. Have you tried uh, a more... Like QLora or something like that? Yeah, or more DCAN, so models that are actually able to do um, training on incremental steps, so we don't have to train all the models again on that case? Um, if I'm going to be honest, no, okay. right? Auto-train by default, the reason why I didn't play around with the hyperparameters is it already actually uses Peft and QLora. Mm. So it can actually create like really quantized and efficient models. Uh, but no, I haven't done incremental training yet, no. Okay, thanks. Hi, thank you for your talk. Um, I'm the, now a master's student in machine learning, um, especially for speech signal processing. Awesome. But also the reason about the knowledge about LLM. Um, I'm curious about the data denoising because uh, first, if we want to train a LLM, uh, especially it's a transform transformer-based model, you need a lot of data. Mm. So is, is it um, for uh, a ch um, challenge for an individual to train their own LLM, or is it more capable for a big company because they have more data, they have multiple, uh, maybe hundreds of waves, WordPress website, and <laughs> yeah. Really good question, and the answer may surprise you. Uh, so, Obviously, I work for a reasonably large company, right? And we also, you know, deal with a lot of data. This particular example, obviously, is built off like one WordPress site, which has a pretty limited data set, right? Uh, and let's say you want to augment it using something like Kaggle. Kaggle's already denoised, right? That's a, that's a very, you know, clean sort of source of data that you can refer to. But let's say you're trying to get data from, let's say, you're, you're, you work in a large company and there's thousands of users that are like importing data into like Salesforce and whatever other analytics tool or thing that, and, and none of it is clean. That conversely, like uh, sort of uh, contrary to what you might believe, large language or large companies probably have the biggest problem with data denoising. Okay, and it's a problem, if I'm going to be honest, that we haven't quite solved yet. Okay, and so my suggestion to people, if they're kind of want to sort of experiment with large language models, 
Don't start with a really large data source first. Start with a clean, small data source. You want to obviously validate your models first, right? And then you need, you need to create from scratch uh, a data pipeline which builds into it denoising as part of the process before it gets into a data lake. Because once it gets into a data lake and it starts building up, right, and you haven't put any denoising into it, and a lot of companies have done that, they've just thought, let's collect all the data and then worry about it later, bad idea. Right, because if you can't access or use that data, then it's pretty useless. Okay. Hi, Robert. Hi, Michelle. So I logged into ChatGPT and said, "What is a question to ask a speaker about generative AI?" Oh, <laughs> this is dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> and this is what I came up with. What potential ethical considerations or safeguards should be implemented when deploying generative AI models in real-world applications? This is a thorny question. I'm so glad I didn't have to think of it myself. It, well, here's the thing. So I don't know if you guys have been keeping an eye on the news. Obviously, Google Gemini recently had a bit of a boo-boo, right? Where it was creating um, images which are a bit problematic from a historical perspective, I'll put it that way, right? Um, <laughs> now, the reason why that is the case is that they did a similar thing here in that when, they, when you give it an input, it actually shapes that prompt by adding additional context. And one of those contexts was to try and create uh, ethnically diverse and gender neutral outputs, right? Unfortunately, if you ask it to give you a Nazi, it will give you a gender neutral and, you know, ethnically diverse Nazi, right? And that doesn't obviously jive with historical accuracy. And so it's really, really important to, and this is the case for anyone who is implementing uh, generative AI technology into their own sort of corporate environments, is to test red team, make sure you provide proper context, make sure you use a test. You will never, oftentimes you won't know what a user is going to put into a prompt. And so really the only thing you can do is try and brute force it and, and get as much data as you can about what people might use it for. Because once data is in a large language model, it becomes a bit of a black box, right? It's basically like if you put something into a soup, you put carrot into a soup, it's very hard to get it back out. Okay. Hey, Robert. Thanks Hi. For the important <laughs> talk. Um, very, really great talk. Um, if, uh, if any AI belongs in core, what is it? Ooh. Like, what initiatives do you feel? Okay, this should be closer to core as opposed to you know the fun experimental stuff on the outside. What is the foundational stuff we should have in a project that we can potentially then build and extend on or have as point features? I think if we go back to the point of making WordPress as accessible as possible, right? Getting more people to use it, because that's part of the point of getting to 50%, right? You have to get more people to use it. Sometimes the way that the WordPress ecosystem has developed now, especially with the fact that everyone kind of does their own thing a little bit, is it can be a little bit disparate and it takes a lot of research, a lot of testing in order to figure out what you want to do, right? And I understand, like, for example, Noel, you said, hey, there needs to be a curated, you know, place to put all of this, right? Maybe a way that we can assist that, you know, is by getting the data about what is most commonly used by new WordPress users, putting that into, say, or providing context to a large language model, and then giving an interface to new users and say, hey, what do you want to build, right? Just like you were saying, and it might output, hey, commonly, when you want to build a new, say, blog for yourself, this is what other people use, right? And that might just be the start. What I see in the future, right, and that might be just the, the first thing you bring into core, what I see in the future is that obviously agents are being created now, and part of agents is creating tools, right? Tools and plugins have a really, really similar kind of function in that all they are is basically scripts, packages, things like that, that allow you to do certain things. So I can see, so for example, the ecosystem of WordPress developers out there, or in this case, maybe, you know, uh, generative AI engineers, right? Creating these tools, putting them into that marketplace, right? And allowing, and creating the agents to be able to use them. And all the person needs to do and go, I want to do this. Oh, well, there's an agent and a tool for that. Let's create a workflow for that, right? There is already pipelines out there allow these agents and tools to work together. So that's something that you could implement into, say, called later, you know? 
Thank you so much, Robert. I think that's a question for today. Um, I believe if anyone else have any more questions, you can always go to Robert um, later today at the conference. He will be happy to discuss with you. Okay. On behalf of uh, WordCamp Asia, we would like to give you this thank you gift. Thank you again, Robert, for this amazing presentation. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Oh, okay.